hundred or so more years ago. They lack basics such as sufficient water, adequate ventilation, facilities for the hygienic washing of nappies and clothes. Cooking is often done on open fires, which poses a risk to children. Overcrowding is endemic, and lack of development has characterized the sector. It's difficult to achieve separation of categories of prisoners, including sometimes women from men, and resources are not available in Africa for the kind of upgrading necessary to ensure that mother and baby units are built in such a way as to comply with the basic requirements of hygiene. That is why the African Charter proposes non-custodial and alternative measures. Second, African prisons are characterized generally by a near complete lack of health care services. This disproportionately affects children who are imprisoned with their caregivers. They may miss out on immunization. Mothers report widespread ailments, coughs, colds, uh, difficulties in breathing, and lung infections. There are no medicine and drugs available for the majority of the continent. Vulnerability to communicable, communicable diseases is very high. There is an extremely low number of female prisoners relative to the male prisoner population. So African government's concern is for the overcrowded male prisoners. Many, in many instances, females are not kept in prisons, but are kept in other institutions such as police lockups and police cells, where they are that much more invisible. The position is therefore in the African Charter that children should not be in prison with their mothers in the first place. Fourth, many African prisons are chronically short of food uh, to the point that uh, starvation is a real risk in some areas and often the availability of food creates severe contests among prisoners. Infants and babies and nursing mothers are at the very back of the queue. African governments do not provide baby food in general. Adequate nutrition is not provided to lactating mothers, and mothers are sometimes forced to find their own food for consumption where the authorities are not able to find food or provide food. <clears throat> this obviously imperils infants and toddlers' rights to food. Lastly, the reality is that for women in some parts of Africa, deprivation of liberty is the result of the commission of status offenses, such as adultery, or they get imprisoned for the non-payment of civil debts such as dowries, leading to the unnecessary incarceration of children, sometimes for indefinite periods. This particularly affects women in the crucial childbearing years. In addition, many women in Africa are deprived of their liberty for loitering, begging, and prostitution, which also results in babies and infants being in detention. So six proposals from our side. Firstly, decriminalization of offenses which are status offenses through vigorous campaigns and through concluding observations from, from your committee to governments that permit the imprisonment of women for status offences. Second, before any emphasis is placed on upgrading or building child-friendly units, measures to develop and implement alternatives to imprisonment suited to the empowerment of women with children should be prioritised. Creative options which allow mothers to continue to breastfeed and to provide care for babies and infants and which do not expose them to any risk of indirect rights violations, such as undue exposure to harsh elements. Life skills and income generating activities should be high on the agenda of alternative measures. When by way of exception women who do commit serious offences for which imprisonment is appropriate, early steps must be taken to ensure the speedy identification of alternative caregivers with preference being given to family or kinship placement or placement in foster care in family type settings. This process should commence prior to the imposition of any sentence, given that pre-trial detention periods can be extremely prolonged in many criminal justice systems in Africa. And next, the approach of the South African Constitutional Court in the case mentioned by Dr. Skelton is to be welcomed and should be encouraged through rigorous training of sentencing officers throughout the continent to alert them to the need to take account of women as primary caregivers. Next, as a matter of last resort, where African countries are able to give effect to specialized mother and baby units, which will be in one or two countries, maybe three at most, these should be properly equipped and I'll list what should be there. And then finally, international cooperation and development assistance in this area should seek to discourage the development of specialized facilities unless 
community-based alternatives to imprisonment are also at the same time implemented. Thank you. on the rights, of ch the rights and welfare of the child. I move on to the gentleman here. C could you please identify yourself? And uh, if you have given us a submission, then I would uh, recommend and ask you not to read the submission, but to give us some uh, summary or some basic points. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair President. I represent Prison Fellowship International, a global association with consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, working in the field of criminal justice and crime prevention, and especially working for restorative justice, for making many of the approaches more restorative. Uh, I would like uh, briefly to point to a problem and then also a recommendation that we would like to see in the report of the working group or of this um, conference, uh, the Committee on the Right of the Child for this attention to the children of incarcerated prisoners. Um, one thing that is of concern to us is that in pre-trial detention, uh, there is a tendency to restrict family visits and there is also restrict children visiting their uh, parents' uh, parent in prison. Uh, as a way of putting pressure on the prisoner for the sake of the investigation, or uh, something that is bordering uh, to torture, to restrict families. Uh, there are sometimes prisoners who are for all, a year in pretrial detention and they're denied a family visit because of the high uh, consideration of, uh, of the investigating judge or investigating officer. So we do believe that uh, recommendations should find place in the, in the final document where we should point to this problem and challenge the, the state to, to turn to it and, and to do something about it. Uh, I would like then to turn to another problem briefly, and it is the visiting centers or uh, places that uh, very often do not deserve this uh, title. Uh, because uh, of uh, crumbling infrastructure or, or places that are uh, really not very welcoming. Now, coming from Eastern Europe, I would like to point uh, that this uh, remains a problem in some countries 20 years after the, the changes there. Uh, and it's enough to go to any prison on Saturday uh, or Sunday when uh, there, there is visiting time to, to see that many parents, many visitors, many family members, children with them are complaining of, uh, of poor conditions. And there was also, ironically, a very serious effort to re re refurbish the prisons. And the only place that was left un unrefurbished and untaken care of uh, are the so-called visiting places or visiting centers. So Prison Fellowship Bulgaria, for instance, um, did a a project in two major prisons in Bulgaria uh, where we challenged the prison administration. Uh, we got premises uh, that were in, uh, in uh, rather shabby conditions and with, with very little investment turned them into a decent places. And there we made it a point that there is a children corner that during these long hours of wait, children should be taken care of. Uh, and this uh, worked uh, very well. It uh, earned the respect of and acceptance of the prison administrations. And now um, our association there is challenged to really do something uh, to do such uh, new style of visiting centers in all the prisons of the country. Uh, we are uh, trying to do also um, this in some uh, former Soviet Republic. So uh, we, in a way, are, uh, if you, the colleagues here uh, like these ideas. We are looking for partners. We can do more together. Very briefly, on a major program uh, that we have addre um, addressed to children, uh, we call it Angel Tree, uh, and it is um, uh, doing Christmas presents to children of prisoners on behalf of the parent in prison doing it uh, through volunteers of churches and the public in general. Um, very often we have uh, you know, donations from businesses, uh, from um, 
personalities, uh, uh, men of culture, of sports, uh, donating to this and visiting prisons um, uh, with children. We are arranging also children groups, uh, visiting parents in prisons, uh, providing the transportation and so on. Um, so uh, just to give you a, a feeling of the scale of what I'm talking about is that the Angel Tree program in the United States in 2010 had roughly 450,000 children receiving gifts from their parents in prison. Uh, another, say, European example, so to say, in the, in the UK, it's uh, just covering under 10,000. In, the, in uh, the Russian Federation, uh, where the program is only three years old, now, last year, 12,000 12, children received a gift from the parent in prison. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, working Group 2 uh, will be discussing pretrial uh, detention and pretrial procedures. So well, I hope that uh, they will come up with some recommendation for pretrial uh, detention. Uh, I give the floor to you, sir. I wanted to talk about um, an evaluation I did of a uh, facility within... Uh, sorry, yes, of course. Um, my name is Ben Rakes, and I work as a senior lecturer at Huddersfield University, and I'm involved in the coping project, which is researching the mental health of children of incarcerated parents. I, d I did an evaluation um, of a facility in an open women's prison in the UK, which um, is unique in England at the moment in that it allows children of all ages, right up to the age of 18, or they could be very young children, to stay with their mothers overnight within a dedicated house within, within the prison itself. And this, if you like, is um, so important, um, given what we've heard about the need that young people have for privacy um, and the fact that most young people don't get that privacy when they're visiting their parent in prison. And what we learnt when we did the evaluation was that for most young people, the, the, the experience of visiting their parent um, often was quite a false one because they felt they could never raise important issues they wanted to talk about because they didn't want to leave the visit on a bad note. However, this facility where children and young people could stay for one or two nights, as I say, within a house, within the prison grounds, but with no supervision at all from prison staff, had the most amazing impact on young people. Young people told us that um, before they had that chance, they felt quite suicidal, and it just completely turned their mental health around to know that they could see their mother in an unrestricted way, and they could do natural things like um, be sit together, um, paint each other's nails, plait each other's hair, dance in the room, things which are just totally not possible in the normal prison visit arrangements. And it just seemed, I suppose I'm raising this because I think that um, the person, what happened was there was a prison um, person who, at that prison, who was managing family services, who pushed and pushed and pushed for many years to get this facility up and running because they had this capacity within the prison. It wasn't easy, but she managed to achieve it, and I feel we can achieve that elsewhere. And I think in other prisons across the world, this does happen, particularly maybe in Scandinavia. And I'd be interested to hear people's experience of it. But I think that this possibility of a private visit is so powerful in terms of helping young people to survive a parent's prison sentence. One of the young women who we spoke to had been um, visiting her mother through a life sentence, and she hadn't seen her mother in those conditions for 10 years or so. And it was hugely, hugely beneficial. Um, and I'm raising it in the hope that maybe we can think how we can extend that facility to other institutions. So thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Madam, you have the floor. Uh, I think Dr. Rani first. Um, am I audible? Okay. 
Um, my name is Rani Shankadas. I'm from India, and I represent an organization called Praja, which is Penal Reform and Justice Association. And I'm also representing Penal Reform International with its offices in the UK. Um, according to what the chairperson said, I won't repeat a lot of the things that are common uh, in my part of the region, and I'm speaking for South Asia, uh, which Julia has already outlined about bad prisons as a result of colonial legacies. Uh, they are applicable to my region as well, so I won't go into that. Uh, which also ties in with the fact that prisons are low priority in such uh, uh, regions. Um, and even if the laws that protect rights of prisoners and of children and women within prisons are in place, because the prisons are low priority socially and within the civil society, um, many of the laws just uh, go by the wayside. Uh, the main point I want to make um, uh, is related to, I think, um, the information angle about the subject. Um, first of all, the way we project figures about women or children within the prison or without are very misleading. Um, actually, that's possibly also because this is a group, children in prison, also women, but at the moment we focus on children. It's not recognized as a group by any state agency or department, whether it's the prisons department or the justice department. Officially, there is no such recognition of the group called uh, children in prison. Um, we've been through some analysis yesterday about how police and courts do not recognize uh, or do not inquire as a matter of routine in their professional capacity uh, at the time of arrest or sentencing whether an offender or a prisoner has children, uh, leave alone the fact of details about children, how many, what gender, what ages, what state of vulnerability, etc. Uh, so in short, there's a glaring shortage of information regarding these children, both in the criminal justice systems of a lot of regions and certainly all of South Asia, which I uh, hasten to add represents a fifth of the world's population. Um, there are no numbers, there are no ages, no details. So there are no reliable ways of directly measuring the number of prisoners' children. And this is the quantitative aspect. If that fails, then the qualitative aspect uh, fails even further. Um, just by way of example, I want to give you a, a very brief statistic for uh, the total number at the end of the year 2009 on a particular day <clears throat> in the prisons in India. Uh, which I might remind you, a population of a billion people. Um, the total number of children of convict women prisoners in 2009, on a particular day when the statistic was taken, was 556. And the total number of pre uh, children of pretrial women prisoners on that day was 1,314. That is roughly about... Um, 18, 1,700 children in prisons all over the country. Now, I, I have a big quarrel with this statistical information because over a year or over a decade um, or over as many years as you wish to calculate, the figures are so um, monumental that 469 and 30, uh, 1,030, uh, 314 means nothing to me because these are the prisons I've worked in and have gone through even in my studies um, as for the year 2009, there are thousands of children that have gone through these prisons which are unrecorded. So I think what I'd like to emphasize here is some method or methodology that should be advocated for actually making this a recognized group in subjects of study, and also doing in-depth research on not just the numbers, but the nature, quality, 
backgrounds, what have you, uh, of all the children in the particular societies um, where they are housed. Um, in, in that connection, I think um, if international bodies, international agencies were able to somehow organize with civil societies in different regions, um, uh, a, a, a civil society and state participation for this in-depth information gathering, it's only then that we can put in place all the qualitative recommendations that, for instance, came in our two brilliant uh, presentations this morning, um, and Skelton's and uh, Isabel from uh, Brazil. Uh, when you're addressing mental health, for instance, how would you address it if you don't have the extensive qualitative information? So that's basically what I'd like to highlight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a lady in front of Dr. Rani, and then I have on my left wing two persons. Uh, and I would like to again emphasize three minutes, please. I've been going up from two to, to 30, two minutes and 30 seconds, and now absolutely three minutes so that we all may have a chance to speak at least once. Thank you. Go ahead, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to speak on behalf of Penal Reform International. My name is Andrea Huber. I would like to raise one general point first, and that is um, about the scope of the problem. We're talking uh, about prisons and the criminal justice system. I'd just like to emphasize that there are other places of detention where this problem arises as well, of course. Um, and one um, that I would like to emphasize particularly is detention pending deportation, where I know from personal experience that a lot of children are held with their parents as well. Um, there are three things that our organization would like to emphasize here, and one is it has been mentioned before, but I have to repeat it, how, how important it is to first consider alternatives to detention. It's a general problem, of course, that so many people are in detention who shouldn't even be there. Uh, and that comes down to a lot of problems, but of course, um, to the issue that we're considering today uh, as well. Um, in terms of the age limit, um, our, our organization has been discussing whether there should even be something like a strict age limit, given it is the best interest of the child that should guide all considerations on whether a child is, is kept with their parent or not. Um, so we were wondering whether there shouldn't be rather a, an indicative age limit maybe, but more a case-to-case -case consideration taking into account a couple of criteria, and I think it will be very important to come up with expert um, advice on what these criteria should be. Uh, one more thing that I would like to stress is that uh, I'm glad that um, we're talking about children of incarcerated parents and not about children of incarcerated mothers only, um, so that we are gender neutral in, in our recommendations and any legislation put in place and any policies and practices uh, should, should apply the same principles for mothers and fathers. Thank you. Thank you very much for stick, sticking to your time limit, too, Thank, and also the, the very important information you're sharing with us. Um, I have the lady in the second row first. Yes. Um, my name is Sarah Salmon, and I'm from Action for Prisoners' Families, which is an umbrella organization for those working with um, prisoners' children and families in England and Wales. Um, i just like to make um, a couple of points. I would completely agree with um, Rani about the numbers. Um, for us, in England and Wales, we need to know where the children are living because local authorities, local areas, will not provide services if they don't know how many children are living near them. And this goes with the problem that children often visit prisons which are a long way from where they live and nobody sees it as their problem because the children live in one area and the prison is located in another. So you can pass the buck. It's very easy to, um, you know, for people and nobody to claim responsibility. Um, for us, in, in England and Wales, if you want to visit um, someone in prison, the prisoner has to send out a visiting order. And some prisoners don't send out visiting orders because they think it's better that their children don't visit. They're, and because sometimes it's very hard, prisoners become quite selfish. They think it's easier not to see their children because it's very difficult to say goodbye. At the end, they find it very distressing. And um, 
and I think in prisons generally there's this conflict. Nobody really thinks about the children's right to see their parents or maintain their family ties. Prisoners think about themselves and the difficulties that they're facing and not really about their children and what their children think about them being held. And also a very big conflict is between security in prisons and the rights to child. And prisons certainly don't think that children have a right to visit and families. They are just concerned about the security and uh, all the bad things that they think children will bring in with them, whether it be drugs or telephones or whatever. Um, and searching goes with that. Um, there is some excellent practice in England and Wales about visits activity and what happens on visits. But again, it's very variable. So sometimes a governor can be running excellent services and they're funded. But at the moment in England, because of the cuts, we're very concerned that those very good services will be lost and they certainly aren't national in all prisons. And just a, finally, a point about older children. I think there's one prison in England in Durham where they have a specific area for teenagers within the prison visitors centre for children to go and they have a worker and people to talk to but that is very very rare and what happens as children get older they want to visit less and less because there's very little for them to do um, so I think they are forgotten many of the services that happen in England and Wales are for smaller children primary age children under eights really that they have all sticking and gluing and things like that and there is very little facilities for older teenagers so I'd really like that for them not to be forgotten. So thank you. Thank you very much. Before I uh, give the floor to other members who are asking for the floor, I would like to ask uh, one of our members on the committee, uh, Ms. Wijerman, to give us her views. Well, Madam Chairperson, um, I want to uh, actually just to uh, highlight a, a special problem that uh, occurs in uh, particularly I think in South Asia and which involves uh, children and it involves women and that is the issue of pregnant women who are often used as couriers for drug trafficking. And now these tend to be um, uh, poor women, they are exploited uh, and they do, uh, they end up in uh, a prison while pregnant. Uh, of course, the child is born in prison, uh, and uh, I would think that this is one of the worst uh, violations of a child's right that the child is actually opens his or her eyes in a prison. Uh, however, uh, the, the judicial system, the law enforcement system, uh, deals with this woman in the same way as any other drug trafficker. So um, there's no good practice or best practices to share, but I'm just highlighting this as a particularly uh, vulnerable situation for the child. And I think it needs a serious consideration uh, in many uh, parts of, at least certainly in Asia, where this phenomenon occurs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wijerman. I have uh, the lady in front here on the second row in the middle. Yes, madam. Could you please uh, press the, yes. Sorry, I'm from Eurochips, which is a European network dealing with um, connecting people who are working with children with imprisoned parents. And I really want to, I mean, it, it isn't exactly the same as what other people have said, but almost. I just would like you to imagine that where you are sitting is a play section in the visits room, and this whole room is a visits hall where we have prisoners coming to visit their families. And if which is similar to many visits halls that you have in, 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 in countries. Some have private visits, but many have large visits halls. And if you have that area there, then the children have a child-friendly space already that they can come and go from. So you four at the top would be the play workers, and you would have toys with you, and the children would come and go. And that is a model that works in many countries, and I would think that that helps. 
considerably. We know it does. We're having research done at the moment. It's not the best, but it, is, it ameliorates the difficult conditions of prisons. And another aspect of that is the training of prison officers, because so often the attitude which people have is actually more important than the physical environment, and that is, is, is really something that can be done. And I... I would, in terms of, we know that there are problems with security, but I think that one of the recommendations I'd like to make is that we don't make the child's right secondary to that. We seek to, we say that that is an inviolable, inviolable right for the child to have contact, and somehow the security measures must be made compatible. And so even when there's heightened security, the measures must be reconciled with the child's rights. And I think that that's something that is, is really possible if we say it's inviolable. Even if the parent is in solitary confinement, somebody could be found to take the child in which wouldn't compromise security if that visit was in the child's best interest. And I think that's, that's really important. Another... I mean, and there's too much to say, but um, I just, in terms of the numbers and in terms of the kind of monitoring of what's happening, in Scotland, the ombudsperson is doing a special report on the rights and status of the children of prisoners. And they've just, they brought the first one out in 2008 and, an, and a review now. And in a sense, this would be an extension of the reports that you already require, but you could have an additional section on the rights and status of children of prisoners, which I, I think is, is, is what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have uh, the gentleman here with the red, uh, yellow sweater, and then the gentleman behind uh, 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 on this side. Yes, go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Benoit van Kersbilk from uh, DCI, Defense for Children International in Belgium. I just would like to um, highlight two uh, different issues. Um, the first one comes from uh, an example we had in, in Belgium. Uh, a, a young lady, a very young lady, she was uh, barely uh, 18 or 19. She was uh, um, put in jail for 18 months because she was begging with her uh, young child. Uh, for, and she was uh, sentenced for uh, 18 months of jail uh, because of uh, this, uh, the, the, this uh, fact. And um, she was allowed to, be, to stay in, in the jail with uh, one of the child. She had two children, and one of the child was uh, a very little baby. Uh, but the problem was that the relation between uh, this child and the other ladies and the other mothers of the uh, prison become, became to be uh, so difficult because the other mo mothers were deprived of any relation with their own chi ch uh, child. And uh, this means that they just uh, wanted to have this contact and this relation with the child, the only child of, the, of uh, this prison, and uh, it became just impossible for this mother to take care of the child and to just have a normal, let's say, normal relation with the child. So at the end, she had to ask the father to go to bring the child, and uh, while she was uh, breastfeeding, so that was quite uh, difficult. So just to say that uh, maybe one dimension we we shouldn't forget is the relation between the mother with a child in the prison and the other ladies, the the other women in the prison. Uh, that could also uh, affect the relation between the mother and the child. And the second issue I would like to uh, highlight, uh, just because I noticed that, uh, once again, in Belgium, uh, it seems that people forget about it, it that it's that uh, for a youngster uh, under 18 uh, who have a child, uh, there is nothing in uh, facilities for uh, adolescents with children there is nothing uh, concerning the possibility for those young mothers to take care and to uh, keep the child with them in those kind of facilities. So this is also something very amazing that nobody thinks about it, but uh, it seems to be a reality. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a person on in the center. Uh, there was somebody in the back. No. She, she's 
Oh, and that we had the gentleman. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There was a gentleman in the back first. Sorry. Okay. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you. I would just like to ask a question. I'm called Maso Make. I'm from Mali, and I work in the Catholic Office of Childhood. I would just like to raise a question. Children who are with their mothers, are they part of the prison population or not? I think that this is a very difficult question to answer, but it should help, uh, it should be addressed by states and civil society. For most of our states, Mali and the Ivory Coast, Togo, the Democratic Republic of, Tongo, of Congo, should look at the motives of imprisonment of children. Is it because the children have been abandoned? They are doubly punished. The fact that their mother has been separated from them, and then secondly, they go to prison with the mother. There's a real problem there. So I want the discussion to address a certain number of issues. Initially, notably a, an appropriate legal framework, but we need to be careful that this does not penalize the life of, pr of children in prison. They should be considered as children in danger. The state would then be forced to address issues such as health and education. It's also important to help set up a network of links. We can share practices between the, our various countries. For example, the uh, example we've heard from Belgium can be applied to the village in my country. With regards to good practices, I noticed that in Cote d'Ivoire, parents Children placed with host families or foster families are starting to look after children during the period of time that women are imprisoned. We should also focus on the implementation of crashes within prisons so that children can have at least a certain level of uh, leisure and playtime. Finally, I would just like to give you a few statistics. For my country in Mali, there are 95,000 children with 95 children, sorry, with their, mar their mothers in prison. I think this is far too many children. This is just a bit of the, an idea that I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the gentleman in the middle, please. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, just two, two issues, one figure. Uh, one, uh, two pr good practices and one, and one figure. In Italy, we have only one special prison, I would say, where children like don't feel being in a, in a prison. It's a flat with no, with officers not wearing uniforms and, uh, and uh, I would say it's the only one. It has been a very strong fight to have it. It's in Milan, but it's a good solution. It could be a solution to be adopted even in all the country and even in other countries. This is one best practice I, want to, I wanted to share with you. A second one is the one we work on. We are from, I am from uh, Bambinis and Sasbare, children without bars. This is the translation from Italy, from Italian. And it's a non-profit organization uh, done with uh, professionals, psychologists, pedagogist, and we created a yellow space that could be defined as a, 
children's sheltered area inside prisons. We created in the, the, the most crowded uh, prisons in Italy, which are in Milan, three of them, the three prisons in Milan. One is very special because we have the mafia, the mafia prisoners. It's a very hard prison, of course, as you can imagine. And these areas, these yellow spaces, has been uh, so well judged and expect, and you know, by the Ministry of Justice that we are going to spread them all around Italy. But the one I wanted to say is, could be the good way for the 1,005, 1,000, yes, 1,010 about in Italy. Every every year we have 1,000, sorry, not 1,000, 100,000 uh, children getting into prison, and I guess about 1,000,000.2, is that right, in Europe. So it's a very huge problem getting, having children visiting parents in prison, and these yellow areas could be one good practice. A, th a third thing I wanted to say, uh, a Eurochief spoke about training prison officers. I give you the figure of a very recent um, research we made in Italy. Uh, it's a huge research. But I give you one, only one figure. The officers trained in the Italian prisons able to deal with children are 11 percent. 89 percent don't receive any kind of training. And they uh, welcome, it's a, a, I would say, what they welcome, as I told you, more than 100,000 100, children per year. So this could be a very important issue, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, somebody from University of fin Finland. Yes, madam. Go ahead. The University of Finland. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. So I'm Rosian Roos, a researcher from the University of Tampere, Finland. And I'd like to share about the uh, Finnish experience about children living in prison with their parents or parent. Um, in 2005, the prison staff um, uh, were worried about the children who were in their ward in prison, and they uh, made it a public and made a pu public debate in Finland. Um, and then um, Parliament State Auditor auditors started a small pilot study which I was involved to and um, after that um, there were ombudsman involved and very many NGOs and so on and um, it has been practiced many many centuries in Finland too that there are children children in prison but there was no official guidelines or nothing really in the law. But then uh, 2009 uh, came a new uh, prison act, and it says, said much more clearly that you should really estimate if it's the best interest of the child to come to prison. Um, but however, it was a part of the prison um, staff members thing to do. Uh, but then there was another change in the Finnish law in 2010, which concerned about Child Welfare Act. And actually, within the five years, uh, Finland has created a quite good framework, I would say, about children entering the prison. And it's a task of the uh, child welfare social worker to estimate the whole situation of the family, um, if it's the best interest of the child to, to enter the prison. And during the stay, there is uh, also um, some uh, estimation regularly um, about this, this issue. And uh, there is only one family unit 
and it's also gender neutral, neutral. So if, for example, it is the best interest of the child that, that uh, she or he comes uh, to prison with her father, it's possible as well. And um, as a researcher, I would like to also highlight that um, in globally, um, there are various situations in different countries uh, and different routes. Uh, some prisons need clear water, for example, of, for these children. So we need to be quite um, precise what we mean when we talk about prisons and what kind of prisons we are talking about. Uh, and uh, also, as a researcher, I would like to highlight this um, statistics and record keeping of these children. How could we do that so that these children are not uh, treated as prisoners because they are not, but still they 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 are somehow could be made uh, institutionally visible so that we can follow up uh, about these children, how they are doing in their lives afterwards, and what do they think themselves when they are they, they are older, because we don't know yet who these children are when they grow up. There are no registers so far. Um, and about the age limits as well, I, I recommend this indicative age limits because there might be some babies whose best interest is not coming to prison with their mothers, for example, heavy drug abusers or, or something. And, um, and on the other hand, there might be some three-year-old or toddler who would benefit that. So thank you. Thank you very much. I have the lady who's raising her hand now. Thank you. Um, I'm Professor Gwyneth Boswell from Boswell Research Fellows and Huddersfield University, uh, sorry, <laughs> University of East Anglia. Um, my colleague Peter Wedge and I have submitted um, an electronic paper um, reflecting on two decades of evidence about support for prisoner-child relationships. Um, but in respect of this session, I just wanted to say that like um, colleagues at Huddersfield University, we are in the process of evaluating what we believe to be also a unique project in the UK prison system, which is PACT's uh, Kinship Care Support Project at Holloway Prison, um, which provides support to the families and friends of the children of imprisoned women at Holloway, people who are actually caring for those children. And the project provides information to the kinship carers. Um, it provides a means of communication between the prisoner mothers and their children's carers um, and one-to-one -one casework support and a whole other range of other support measures throughout sentence. Um, but just one person provides this support on um, a three-day week basis for hundreds of prisoners and their children's carers and clearly this is quite inadequate. Um, the evaluation is not yet complete, so I can't reveal any detailed findings at this stage. But what I can say is that it's clearly um, a much-needed service for prisoners who are primary carers, and that also will include some men, as we know. Um, and just listening to Anne Skelton's presentation this morning about the African Charter, um, this would seem to be a provision which perhaps could begin to move towards the position where it, it is a court's duty in more countries than South Africa to ensure suitable arrangements for the care of children of parents for whom there really is no alternative to a prison sentence. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the lady in the, on that same row, but you, yes. Thank you very much. My name is Mary Pierre Wade. I'm from the Mission of Canada. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, thank you to the Committee of the Rights of the Child for convening this meeting and to the panelists for their excellent presentations this morning. I'd like to share uh, a number of best practices from the Correctional Service of Canada's Mother Child Program, which may be of interest to participants here today. 
The goal of the Correctional Service of Canada's institutional mother-child program is to offer a supportive environment that fosters and promotes stability and continuity for the mother-child relationship. As highlighted by many of the panelists this morning, while permitting children to live in a correctional institution with their mother may be a contentious issue, for many women inmates, the loss of their children is often an added stressor that creates barriers to addressing the problems that lead to their incarceration, which in turn negatively impacts on their reintegration capacities. Prior to acceptance into the mother-child program, mothers must meet several eligibility criteria and the local child welfare agency must assess whether participation is in the best interests of the child. A woman is eligible to participate if she has not been convicted of a serious crime involving violence, a serious crime involving a child or any sexual offense involving a child or a serious crime of a sexual nature. She must be classified as either minimum or medium security. She must be screened to verify if information exists to indicate that she may pose a risk to the child. She must also complete a parenting program and a first aid course. Eligibility criteria for the children is based on the age of the child, maximum six years of age for participation in the part-time program and maximum four years of age for participation in the full-time program. A child may enter the program at any time in keeping with the established age limits for participation in the full and part-time programs. Children residing with their mother are accommodated in mother-child houses, which typically has a yard surrounded by a low fence to provide the child with a play area and sleep in the same room or adjoining room as their mother. Only non-intrusive searches of children are permitted when they're entering or leaving the institution. Routine health care for the child is normally provided by community health care agencies outside the institution. Day-to-day -day assistance may be provided by institution health care services if resources are available. And children are afforded every opportunity to visit with non-incarcerated family members to maintain relationships. The child can also attend age-appropriate activities in the community with non-incarcerated members of their family. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Could we ask you to give us a submission on that so that maybe our participants can learn from your practice? Thank you. Uh, lady, yes, thank you. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. I'm uh, Maria Mercedes Rossi from the Associazione Comunità Papa Giovanni XXIII. And uh, I would like to, to, to bring our experience from Italy as well. And um, first of all, uh, we made also a written submission, so you can, uh, can collect it. First of all, I would like to say that the, the Council of Europe already recommends uh, the, uh, the, the developing and use of community-based penalties for mothers of young children and to avoid the use of uh, prison custody. In Italy, uh, our colleague first was mentioning the number, the statistics, I would like to say that in Italy at the moment, at for what we know, there are uh, 55 women in prison with their own children. And uh, uh, the majority of these children are below three years of age. And uh, 41 of these women are from other nationalities, are not Italian. And uh, the provision of the law in Italy already foresees uh, the possibility of uh, home detention or non-custodial uh, 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 penalties. So there is room for developing and using this community-based initiative. We made a proposal to the Italian government that is still under scrutiny to entrust in our community because we have got 254 family homes throughout the national territory. Uh, uh, to entrust these mothers uh, uh, as much as possible with their children uh, and we can use also the foster care of open families uh, to avoid the custody in prison. Um, the point that would, we would like to make is this one. Surely the, the child has got the fundamental right 
to stay and grow uh, with the, uh, the natural mother. So it is important also when the mother is in prison that the child, especially in the first years of development, can stay with the mother. But the child has also the fundamental right to grow in a, a family environment and in a social environment which can be conducive, it needs also to stay with other children, to play around, and so on and so on. So for this reason, really, we would like the, the main recommendation from this can be the developing and use of community-based initiative and the member states to make laws that can give this provision. It is a delicate and complex uh, issue. There, are, uh, uh, co there is cooperation that should go on with these community initiatives and the judiciary system, the, the social welfare and the prisons and so on, but I think it is uh, worthy and it is possible. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there any other hands? Yes, a uh, gentleman with the orange tie, and then I've got the mission from New Zealand, right? Thank you. Bonjour, je suis Claude Janetti du ministère de la Famille. Claude Janetti, Ministry for the Luxembourg Family Units. In Luxembourg, we have a state system which organizes meetings between children and their parents who are in prison on the request of the imprisoned parents. Then there will be individual meetings with the imprisoned parents, with the child, to see what their real desire is, and with the rest of the family environment. Visits are organized separate from other visits by adults. So there are visits where the premises, premises are particularly set aside for these visits. Normally, it's these visits last for an hour. Or, but sometimes, for example, at Christmas or a carnival time, these visits can last two hours. During these visits, only the imprisoned parents and the children are present, along with some social workers. There will be no other adults present during these visits. When it comes to preparing festival times, imprisoned parents are allowed to, to do workshops with the children so that they can make this contact a little bit more natural, whereas otherwise it would be quite difficult for the child. It would be a question-answer kind of scenario, so when there's a workshop and craft work going on, it's easier for the discussion to take place. Outside of these visits, the state service provides groups for parents in prison discussion groups which can address difficulties encountered by parents in prison, problems with how they can talk to their children, talk about this crime or event that is at the root of their imprisonment. And these groups are to help prepare the adult for their role as a parent. Finally, once the sentence is completed. The service continues to organize meetings for the parents who are released and who start to try to rebuild their lives so that they can rebuild their lives being a parent and being aware of what this rule involves. I would just like to highlight something about this initiative. It's that in all cases, the parent who's in, imprisoned, if they have abused the child, or in a, cha in a situation where the parent has killed or, ex or um, harmed the other parent, we need to look to see if this initiative is appropriate or not. 
Well, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now I have a mission from New Zealand. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. It's, it's, it's always a, a, a pleasure to see you again, and, and, and good morning to colleagues, and, and thank you to all of those who have spoken. We've, we've found the presentations uh, and the experiences from, from all parts of the world very interesting. Now, I've received a, a great deal of material from, from my capital, and I, I, I will not read it out because I respect, of course, that, that we're already running behind schedule, but I will be happy to forward it to you electronically, Madam Chair, and I'll just make a, a few comments about some of the practices from New Zealand, which may be of interest to, to some of you. Um, we've had a law change just this month in New Zealand. Previously, uh, babies could stay with, with their mothers in prisons up to the age of nine months. That's been changed uh, just this month. The new age is up to two years. And that will take place in what are called self-care units. These are a, a step between a prison environment and a, a, a external living in the community. What they are is a, is a, a home share or a flatting type situation which provide feeding and, and bonding uh, facilities for, for visiting. Uh, they, they replicate a, a domestic lounge setting. There's a, a separate bathroom, a separate kitchen, separate sleeping area for, for the child and so on, and an external courtyard area um, to, to allow for these visits. And the, the purpose of this policy is to ensure that the child has an opportunity to bond with its primary caregiver in a safe, uh, supportive environment, and that a functional relationship can be established uh, pending the release of the mother. Not, not all mothers and children are, are immediately eligible for the program. There are certain criteria, including, uh, of course, the, the best interests of the child. Um, in addition to, to establishing a relationship between the mother and child, it's also intended that the policy could contribute to the likelihood of of the mother reoffending, obviously in the in the long-term interests of the child, and it's also uh, intended that the policy can lower the risk of intergenerational uh, criminality as well. So that's a little bit about the the policy and and its its rationale. I will also tell you uh, a little bit about some of the programs very briefly that. Uh,